psychopathic abilities, you know, how early you notice them and just, you know, do they have you gradually gotten more sensitive or just kind of your background with, with being a highly sensitive person or an empath? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And it's a really important question, especially in this interview, just to really allow me to share a bit, a little bit of my story, but also let people understand that I'm not just like, I'm not theorizing. I'm not just saying things that sound cool. I'm saying things that actually work and have worked for me and things that I've learned uh, out of my own journey, not just something I read in a book that sounds cool or made me feel good for a few minutes, like stuff that was born out of trial and tribulation and a lot of sweat. Right. <laughs> so I don't, I, I think it's something that I've definitely felt my entire life, but didn't know. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a common thread for a lot of people is, we feel things, but we don't necessarily know. We don't necessarily have a, a point of reference or a contrast. And we sometimes naively think everyone feels the same way. But as I'm sure many people have experienced, if they try to share what they feel or what they see or what they sense, very often resistance is met. And then that can be a very difficult and kind of traumatic experience to to have especially very early on right you know when we're kids we feel or say something or whatever people are like oh that's silly that's nonsense why would you do that that doesn't make any sense or that's you know we could go down the whole line of you know less less gentle ways of basically telling someone that they're wrong or something about them is broken so it, it really creates a sense of in some ways feeling alienated in a lot of ways and isolated because you know I'm, there are some people who I know that are, were born sensitive and their parents were pretty sensitive as well and their parents could relate to where they're coming from and said oh no you're fine don't worry about it like it's just this is just who you are this is this this is that and they can explain it to them right. and and give them something that is empowering and what I'm what is empowering and what I've eventually learned is basically being able to articulate things being able to understand things because, you know, if you're taking a road trip and, you know, you're in a place that you've never been before and you don't have a map, you don't necessarily know where you are. It can be a little bit disconcerting, but if you have a map, you're like, oh, well, this is just this place and we're halfway there. You know, I'm sure this is foreign, sure this is unfamiliar, but here we are on the map. Oh, okay, that makes sense. And that gives us kind of a, a little bit of a point of reference. So I can, I can definitely remember actually very distinct moments for a lot of my um, childhood and teenage years of just really thinking to myself, like, what the fuck are people doing? <laughs> like, just like, what, why are you doing that? What are you, what is this? Mm-hmm. And really seeing uh, kind of, the lie, so to speak, you know, like kind of what, what people say versus what they actually do, what they say they believe versus what they actually believe and do and live. Mm -hmm. And then, and then experiencing a lot of sort of emotional stuff that you eventually realize, Oh, that that actually isn't me. You know, like uh, what I was saying earlier about a lot of ups and downs as like a teenager is just, you know, as kids, we don't necessarily have a choice who we're around. You know, we have our family, and that's our family. We have our friends, you know, based on what neighborhood we live in or what school we go to. We have our classmates because we're at that school. We don't really have a choice about who we're around. And if we haven't necessarily developed an articulation and a point of reference inside of ourselves, then it's very easy to get lost in that world. And we sort of really, we don't know who we are. We feel like who all we are is just this chaos because we're so much picking up information or sensations from everyone around us. And they're not necessarily aware that they're even putting it out. So to make it a bit more personal and specific, I can remember once I started to get a bit more aware of this, and started to understand it. I remember when I was in college, 
this was probably like 2005, maybe four or five. Mm-hmm. Remember, I wrote this poem called Karmic Sponge. Mm-hmm. And I did, at the time, I was just kind of in this phase where I was just writing a shit ton. And I didn't really, it wasn't an intellectual process. It was just sort of coming through, as people say. But, you know, this was probably like seven or eight years ago. But over the years, I've constantly gone back and been like, oh, wait, I think I was like kind of on to something. <laughs> with that. Like, I didn't really know what I was talking about, but I kind of did know what I was talking about. Yeah. So it's something that I've, again, once I started to have a map and a point of reference and an ability to articulate things, then I started to say, ah, oh, OK, aha that's them, this is me, or that's why that was happening, or that's what I was picking up on or sensing, or, oh, that's why, you know, (laughs) that's why in so many relationships I'm talking about things and saying things that they have no fucking clue about. (laughs) And then it's like, oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm whatever, picking up on this stuff or sensing this stuff, and they're not really aware of it or don't really want to be aware of it oh, this is why, oh, okay, that makes way more sense now. Rather than feeling like, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? And then going down the whole sort of anxiety thing. Exactly. So it's something I've definitely dealt with a lot and still deal with a lot. And as far as getting more and more sensitive, I would say that definitely as I've gotten older that I have, I don't know if I would say I've gotten more sensitive or I've become more aware of the sensitivity that was already there the whole time Mm -hmm. or removed the the blockages or the armoring or the stagnation because I think a lot of people come in very sensitive and then they build up armoring they build up armoring meaning like muscular tension um, you know tension around the organs tension in the fascia system and literally deep deep protective mechanism in the body where we're kind of literally strangling ourselves We're like literally killing ourselves in a very slow (laughs) kind of way because there's, you know, our fascia, our connective tissue surrounds everything in our body. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get caught in that, you know, fight or flight thing and that really just sort of clenches around usually the the pelvis area and then around the um, diaphragm and and the abdomen where people get really tight and that sort of creates this protective armoring in the body. So, like, through processes in my own life of doing, just doing meditation and health stuff and herbs and, um, and then actually lately in the last, um, the last, I would say, four or five months, uh, the whole thing has really gone to a new level once I really got more serious and dedicated about just my own practice and taking care of myself energetically and really just letting go of a lot of the bullshit and trying to just surrender to the creative process or whatever you want to call it that's inside of me, stopping, you know, all of the, the old conditioning and the fear and the what if, and I should, and I must, and all of that stuff. So in that regard, in that regard, that is really amped up sensitivity to a large degree, right. but also within there is, is a learning to kind of turn it on and off. And to be able to kind of modulate it, which I think that is a really, really important skill. And I'm insanely grateful for the teachers that I've been able to connect with and the practices that I've been able to connect with. Otherwise, I don't really know <laughs> where I would be here, what I would be doing. And that's that's kind of why I wanted to do this interview is to be able to share some of what I've learned over the last however many years or whatever. Um, just because I think it's really important and it's really helped me a lot. And I don't know if there's necessarily a lot of people offering real, like tangible, grounded, pragmatic information for, I don't want to say people like us, but kind of. (laughs) Exactly. Which is also why I was excited to talk to you because you come from, um, sort of with your background in, in herbs and in sort of internal martial arts and meditation and that whole Eastern mindset I think it's a really interesting um, perspective to have in regards specifically to empaths and and highly sensitive people. And um, kind of what you were just talking about leads to one of my questions, which is, 
you talk about addictions and sicknesses and, you know, what's going on in our internal world and how we get divided in the self. Um, so I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about that in regards to these practices that you've learned that have helped you n not get sick and not have addictions within this, this process of numbing out what most people do when they just feel too much. They just numb out. Yeah, well, I should say first and foremost, you know, I'm definitely not perfect and definitely not free of <laughs> the human condition. Is there, uh, you know, every this is this whole thing is a process. You know, we're all here to learn. We're all here on a journey. And we're all on our own journey. And we're on different places and points, and that's just kind of how it is. Shit, uh, I totally thought you were perfect. <laughs> I don't even want to do the interview anymore. I know, right? Fuck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think uh, I think what I've really started to realize and come to from studying Chinese medicine and from studying a lot of esoteric stuff in even Western magical traditions and esoteric traditions and all kinds of weird stuff is that basically a lot of the the addictions and the internal imbalances that people are dealing with, in my opinion, is largely psychosomatic if you want to call it that or psycho-spiritual mm -hmm. and sometimes also too it's just either something that we picked up from someone else you know maybe we grew up in a certain kind of environment around certain kinds of people that believed things and handled things in certain ways so we just picked that up and we realized oh well that's just how you do it because that's just what I learned in my environment and then, but let's say that pattern is not necessarily very uh, harmonious for us, for our unique system and blueprint. So then obviously if we try to live that way, that's probably going to create some kind of internal pathogen. Because within Chinese medicine, there's the understanding that there's internal pathogens and external pathogens. And really in Western culture, our understanding, to be quite honest, is juvenile at best as far as understanding the nature of the physical world. Juvenile out at best, and I would say extremely just adolescently destructive at worst. Right. But that's kind of a different conversation. But within this understanding, you know, obviously there's external pathogens, things like, you know, heat and cold and damp and things in our, in, the, in our environment which can throw off the balance of our internal world. But on the flip side, there's the internal pathogens, and that these would be extreme emotions, or what I mean by that is emotions that become stuck and fixated, wherein that becomes our point of reference and our the way in which we see the world is through that one emotional lens. Because the thing is, is some people, especially when they get into the whole new agey thing, is they try to de-emotionalize themselves and sort of dehumanize themselves. And that's not that's not real. That's not good. That's not a good path to go down. But that's actually the same path that the mainstream culture is trying to go down with the drugs and the constant, you know, distraction, dehumanization, that whole thing. Right. So, you know, happiness, sadness, joy, depression, anxiety, frustration, anger, fear, these are all normal parts of human life. <laughs> And that's, that's really an important thing to point out is because we're not necessarily the most uh, emotionally mature culture either. <laughs> so, and this is a big point that I really want to get across to everyone, is to say that it's actually natural to feel angry or sad or depressed in, re in reaction to something that's fucked up. Right. Like, that's actually the correct response to have. Exactly. <laughs> but it, it becomes incorrect because everyone's telling us that, no, no, it's okay. No, no, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. And the other side of that that I want to get across is just because millions of people share the same pathology doesn't mean that that's actually healthy or correct. Right. So at some point, we have to be courageous and just trust ourselves trust life and trust what we feel and go with that and just and make that choice and it's it's not easy 
and it's not gonna always be pretty because if you read a lot of new agey stuff it's it's does people want to disturb it's helpful because it's like hey you have power you know you can attract things you can manifest things you can create reality you can make change you can do all these things sure definitely that is a definite piece but what they don't tell people is that doesn't mean your life isn't going to be fucked up that doesn't mean you're not going to experience a ton of shit in the process because that's that's kind of how life works you say you want to be a millionaire you watch the secret people think you're just going to walk to your mailbox one day and there's going to be a check for a million dollars well what about the fact that you don't have the skill set or the repertoire to actually create that amount of wealth and handle and manage that kind of wealth? Exactly. So it's kind of like saying, I'm going to be a concert pianist. Well, you have to, going to have to practice like a lot right. and dedicate your life and actually make the choice to say, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to be dedicated to this and trust and surrender to that process. So those are all really, really important things. And I guess to get back to my original point is that I think people, we need to really look at that and really start to understand the concept of self and other and distinguish what is us and what is not us. And through, there's many, many, many ways of doing that, whether it's various forms of art or divination or, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter what the, what the specific method is. The really the important thing is making the choice and the decision to to do that, to go on that path and to go on that journey, and to be able to set aside all of the the kind of crap. Now, <laughs> to be honest, I kind of forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we were just talking about um, addictions and sickness, and uh, you know why we get divided inside, and and you're sort of alluding to the fact that we don't have really an understanding of. Well, one is emotions. Is what I'm getting out of what you're what you're saying is that most people don't have an, any clue about the role emotions play and what they are. And then a lot of the tools that we've been given, or to, especially in the New Age community, um, although, like you said, there's a lot of great things that you know, a lot of tips or whatever. But I think it um, really teaches a lot of people to just spiritually bypass and and yep. sort of not do the work of self-reflection and, and understanding, um, you know, the, the, I think especially the role of emotions, especially for people who are sensitive and, and for empaths. Because, you know, my friend Till Swan says that we're in the emotional dark ages, and I, I think that is so true, like that one day we will look back, you know, at our culture now, like we look back at the early psychology years when they were doing lobotomies on people. Like it's just yeah. really fucked up the way that we treat people as if, you know, there's about three emotions that are acceptable and anything else is unacceptable. And you're just somehow wrong if you're not in these sort of, um, you know, emotional boxes and not just emotions, but everything, you know I mean? It's just kind of, there's a huge gamut of things we're told that are acceptable and not acceptable. And I think you're right that in a lot of ways, the new age community just sort of perpetuates that same ideal. It just does it in a different way. <laughs> yeah. And, and what a lot of people don't necessarily realize not to get conspiratorial for a minute, but some of the same people behind uh, a lot of the mainstream stuff are also behind some of the new age stuff. If you really, take it back and really examine these things. Right. And it's also, uh, it's also the thing that, and I, I mentioned this in a talk once that if you hear something and it's like a real easy train for you to get on board with, then it's probably not real. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you're, if you're just like, Oh my God. Yeah. And then just jump on and like surrender to that. That's not necessarily real. And also, I have, I've been having this thing I've been working on called the symptoms of truth mm -hmm. and how the closer you get to reality, the less sense that it makes. Yes, exactly. Which, I mean, in, in quantum physics, it's kind of, they've arrived at the same thing, which is, I mean, good for them. It only took a few hundred years, whereas mystics have been saying it forever. Exactly. Uh, but hey, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But well, um, I think it's but, interesting, too, with that is that the idea that reality, the closer you get to it, doesn't make any sense. I think that one thing that a lot of 
quote unquote spiritual people forget to leave out of the equation too is at least for me and a lot of people that I know the the process of sort of waking up if you want to call it that can be really traumatic <laughs> like it's not just like a it doesn't it's not necessarily just this amazing euphoric experience you know because it, it requires an ego death in a lot of ways and to realize that things that you thought were real aren't really real I mean it's freeing in so many ways but it also can be kind of disconcerting and and you know, you can feel disoriented, and I don't know, for me, it's been both amazing and traumatic. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think if, and I think that comes down to marketing, you know, because if, if people are writing a book, and they're like, hey, this is really going to ruin your life in a lot of ways, like, <laughs> all those, all those social connections you have right now, they're probably going to go, your job, everything you think, all the stuff you've been working on, you're probably going to have to get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> people wouldn't, wouldn't <laughs> buy that book. <laughs> You're so they right. Yeah. It's just, it's, it wouldn't work. But yeah, I mean, I guess to put it in context, I can give you a really good example is um, in my own life for a lot of years, I've just had kind of what people might call like a love addiction, you know, mm-hmm. where I've had this thing and just clung to relationships and just kept doing this pattern over and over till it eventually really did a real number on my health, you know, where I was like, had pretty bad exhaustion and just felt just dr- totally drained emotionally and, and physically. And then basically like kind of where I'm at right now is exactly what you're talking about. So for the last however many weeks or whatever, pretty much all I've been doing all day, every day is just training qigong and, and meditating for two to six hours a day sometimes more or less wow. just doing that and writing and not really anything else you know go for a walk eat some food simple stuff and a lot of people might say like wow that sounds like fucking paradise and sometimes it is you know i'll have like the last few days just was on such a high you know mm-hmm. like writing and i got like 20 articles started and just like really doing it but then <laughs> along with that it's just so much pain and like yeah. feeling really terrible but also s- feeling good about feeling terrible right. so exactly. and the, the major point that I'm making here is we live in a world where it's so easy to uh, which is amazing and it's amazing that we live in this time but it makes it real easy to to regress so what I what I could do is be like you know what I feel like shit I'm lonely I'm bored I have all this fear and anxiety in my mind. Fuck this stuff. Let me just go on the internet. And there's so many online dating sites. You know, you can meet someone and be dating someone in minutes if, you, if you're if you really gung-ho about it. And, you know, definitely I had a part of my brain that was like, yeah, just do it. But then the rest of, my, rest of me was like, that's garbage. Like, the rest of my whole body was just crying out and, like, pain. Like, no, don't do that. That's disgusting. Like... <laughs> We, we will we will give you the worst anxiety and stomach ache of your life if you do that bullshit. So pretty much at that point, it's like, okay. So then it's like, it's the exact example of just, you know what? Feeling like shit, feeling isolated, feeling alone, feeling all kinds of different things. And then a lot of people say, well, what, what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do about that? And my response is, just feel it. Yes. Like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like well, people are like, what do you, well, what do you do, what are you gonna do if you feel lonely? Well, I'll feel lonely, right? Exactly. Because th- this is the other side of it is that there's such a thing in life as cycles and phases. Mm-hmm. Things go up, they go down, they expand, they contract. But in the same way, and this goes back to what we were saying about feeling divided or having these addictions is that we're taught and we're conditioned to think, you know what, it needs to be spring or summer all the time. It needs to be happy and positive all the time. Yep. We, we want to live in Disneyland forever. <laughs> that's, that's not real. You know, there's a time and a place. But what happens is we create a lot of suffering for ourselves. We create a lot of disease for ourselves because we ignore that. You know, if our, an easy example is our body is saying, this is a time to rest. But our mind and our conditioning and everything else is saying, you know what? You need to go out and do this. You need to go out and, you know, see all these people. You need to get all these things done. You need to be active. But then our body is like, no, 
So then what do people do? All right, well, I got to have some coffee. I got to get my five hour energy. I got to eat all this stuff. I got to get ramped up so I can go out and deal with all this bullshit that I 100% don't want to deal with, Yeah. which sometimes we all have to make that sacrifice. You know, life isn't perfect. Sometimes we have to work. Sometimes we have to do things. That's just how it is. In that instance, it's just making a better decision or making a more, you know, holistic approach rather than a destructive one. But it's kind of different. But I just wanted to throw that in because that's kind of like very relevant um, to what I'm dealing with, what I'm feeling. Yeah, exactly. I love I love that point that you made. And I think it's so hard for for everybody. I think it's, it's a hard thing to just feel and allow yourself to feel. But one of the things that I've realized with being, you know, really sensitive is that when I try to run from how I feel, that is when I get addicted to things and relationships is one of them as well. Relationships are even just, um, for empaths, I think needing to be needed. Like for me for a long time, it was like, I got my sense of worth of people loved me and I was everybody's best friend and I could be there for anybody when they were going through trauma. And I loved being there for anyone who was going through some major trauma or, or dramatic situation because I didn't have to think about my stuff. I didn't have to feel what I was feeling. And if I was feeling someone else, not only could I, you know, be there for them, but I could also, I could also just basically, um, well, there's a lot of things, but I think that, um, just fueling a codependent relationships is is very common for empaths or whether it's with a person or, or codependency on, Um, drugs or alcohol or just spending money or even spirituality just being totally obsessed with having to do something that makes you run from how you actually feel and I think that's a really good point my mind's going all over the place right now because there's like so many things I want to say but I just I love that point that you made and I wanted oh sorry go ahead uh, one other thing I want to talk about this whole thing about people get into a really a didactic or a dualism about, you know, this is spiritual and this isn't. This is physical and this is spiritual and this is... People make up all these divisions. But I'm what I've understood or seen for a long time is that there's no difference. And if we look at what is the most spiritual thing you can do, it's kind of obvious. We've always seen it, but never really seen it. So we often... We've been really brought up in in a culture that worships people... Who are holy, right? The word holy is a very powerful word. And you would people would believe you ask, like, if if you're a holy person, are you a spiritual person? Probably. I mean, kind of they kind of contextually kind of go hand in hand in a lot of ways. But if you if we look at the actual etymology of the word holy, it shares its roots with the word holistic and the word whole. Hmm. They all have basically the same meaning. So the most spiritual thing we can do if you want to use such, I guess, uh, divisions or explanations or whatever, is actually doing that work of becoming whole, of becoming a whole person, a unified being. That is the most spiritual thing that we can do. Not, not all this like chanting and incense and whatever that people get into that they think, oh, this is spiritual. Oh, I go to this or I go to that or I'm a member of this group or whatever. It's like if you're not in touch with your own essence, your own soul, your own whatever it is that is inside of you that is actually you, then it doesn't really matter what you are going to do. You could be a disconnected, divided, psychophobic person who is addicted to cigarettes and drinks beer all day. You can be that same person. You could quit all that stuff then now you're a vegetarian and you drive a Prius and you recycle and you go to yoga and you chant and you're, and you, you get a certain, you get a certain suppression in your voice that you hear in a lot of spiritual people. Yeah. It's just very, yeah, you know, I'm just I'm really into it. You know, it's, a, people get, it's like they're suppressing themselves so hard that it's like, that does not really seem very spiritual or, healthy in that regard at all but it really comes back to understanding this whole thing about being whole and it's not necessarily in the scope of this conversation but there's a load of references in the bible that make uh or make reference to that and in like the gospel of thomas and the gnostic gospels and the dead sea scrolls for people who are into that tradition and then pretty much every other uh tradition 
has a lot of um, reference to that concept as well. Right. I really like that because I've always, I grew up in a religious background, but the way that I always heard the word holy described as being set apart, which in my mind always created duality because it's set apart from whatever exactly. the community means. So that, I really love that idea of it. That's exactly where it comes from is the idea of being whole, which is kind of counterintuitive to the idea of being set apart. <laughs> Yeah, and if, if people, you know, people talk about saints and sages and holy people as having, like, you know, special powers or unique abilities or whatever, everyone has that capacity within them. Right. But if you're caught up living some bullshit mundane life based in conditioning and anxiety, there is no way in hell you're very likely to manifest those gifts in a very powerful way. Now, obviously, there's exceptions to that for sure because there are some people who just are born and have it. But I think the the bulk of us have had them or do have them somewhere in there, but they're covered up with a lot of a lot of junk. And that sounds weird, but if you think about, you know, if you have you know a battery in your car, right? You know, you can have the the most charged battery in the world, but if all the cables are fried, the car is not going to start. Yeah. So if the cables can then you know, metaphorically be our energy system or whatever, then we can open those things up. And the other trick of that is people study these people and think they want to be like them or I want to do what they did. Again, not not the right, necessarily the right train of thought to go on because unless we're able to step into our own uniqueness, then we're not really going to necessarily have the chance to discover our own gifts. Right. And what would you say is the, in your experience, what has been the best sort of way that you've been able to get in touch with that part of you? Uh, I would say probably like meditation and music. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are really pretty good. And, but also, you know, in the last however, however many months or years or whatever, just uh, Qigong and, Nagong practice and that whole thing. But the thing is, is in the sort of new mainstream new age or spiritual world, if you want to call it that, uh, we speak in a lot of generalities. You know, we talk about energy or spirit or soul and all these different things. But when we get to Chinese medicine, not even Chinese medicine necessarily, because people have to understand that what is bought and sold on the mass level today as Chinese medicine is in Chinese medicine. It was made up in the 1950s by the communists for specific, specifically for export to the Western world and also just for cheap healthcare for their own people. Cause basically Mao Mao Zedong said, you know, all this old stuff we have in our culture is evil and we have to get rid of it. And they did, they, they killed, I think around 60 million of their own people which this is the thing is a lot of people, most people don't even know anything about this because the Western world couldn't really give a shit about it for the most part. And they kept it, you know, uh, they kept it all locked in. They didn't have, you know, media news people in there. So people don't really know that. So it's another little caveat that I should throw in is a lot of people, I didn't see it really want to idealize. Oh, it comes from India. It's ancient. Or, Oh, it comes from China. It's ancient. Or, it comes from Tibet. It's ancient. Please don't do that. Those cultures are equally just as corrupt, if not sometimes even more evil and corrupt than our even modern day culture. But it's not really the point of the interview, so I'm not going to go into examples from each of those cultures, but the information is there if anyone wants to do the research. Interesting. So this is the thing is, you know, if we take it back, which is maybe Taoism or alchemical Taoism, for example, which is the whole thing with Chinese medicine, all the health practices was only created by alchemists to support immortality. That was spiritual immortality and spiritual realization. That's really all they're like, Oh wait. Oh yeah. People need to be physically healthy too. All right. I guess we'll just create this medicine system because this will help us in, in this quest. It wasn't really about treating disease, but through that things are very, very, very specific in that system. There's a specific distinction between spirit energy and the physical, you know, spiritual and the energetic are actually two different things. They're different realms. They're different vibrations. Hmm. 
and each each vibration has different nuances and levels and it's and then even within the spirits there's different spirits within each organ and it really gets very specific and very detailed and articulated which is something which that's really what drew me to it and the more i learn the more i try to share with people because we're sorely lacking again the articulation and the map right and we're sort of still just kind of fumbling in the dark. So I think what is the most important thing for to answer your question, basically what all the practices have in common is basically helping me or helping people get in touch with the actual real thing that all these words are talking about. Because we can talk about spiritual experiences. We can talk about energy. We can talk about vibrations or talk about chi or, creativity or spirit or insight that's cool but the actual experience of those is very different than any words we can put on them right so whatever whatever it is that allows us to basically actually touch and feel and be with that that's really where it's at right and it would seem that really getting in touch with um not only through meditation with that those places within you, but also understanding what they are, I think, especially for empaths, can be really important because it can get confusing when you're just very sensitive to energy in general and you're feeling a lot and a lot's passing through, and especially if you don't meditate. Um, Because I know a lot of empaths struggle with meditation because it brings up so much. (laughs) And if you don't understand what it is that you're feeling or experiencing or if you attach too much to it, even emotion, like believing that you are what you feel or you are what you think, I think that at least from the little bit that I've delved into some of the things you're talking about, it seems like having those distinctions and understanding what they are actually helps sort of, it helps me anyway to feel less overwhelmed about all the, everything that I feel all the time or just kind of feel and experience in general. So would you say that that's also been a part of what's been helpful for you in doing these practices? Yeah, for sure. It's just like I was saying earlier, just having a map, having a point of reference and having some structure. And this is really, really the, another major important point that I'd like to make is that, whoa. (laughs) Another major point is that sometimes people get really carried away in a very kind of weak feminine state. I know that sounds weird, but and what I mean by that is like too much surrender, too much sensitivity, too much openness, too much letting go, mm-hmm. you know, too much nurturing, too much taking care of other people. Yes. And that is not healthy. You know, I know the feminine has been suppressed and repressed and destroyed in our culture for a very long time. I get that. And it's tragic and it's really fucked up. But that's not the point of the interview. And that's not necessarily that helpful to go down that road. What is helpful to realize that, to see it, and then to take actions and make strides in our own life to undo that. Because this is the other thing is we can look out in the world, we can blame other people, we can do all this research and see all these things in the world, but it's also happening inside of us. Yes. You know, the same mental programming that causes people to commit violence or crimes or start wars or whatever, we have that same mental programming inside of us. And it's really easy to sit to watch TV or to watch dramas or look at history and be like, yeah, that person was crazy, but not me. Mm-hmm. And sure, we may not have taken it to that extreme, but those seeds exist within inside of us as well. So what I think a lot of people really need is a bit more of a mature masculine development. So a, one way of understanding that is yes, being open and sensing and feeling and allowing and letting go and drifting and having the understanding. So having the spiritual and the intellectual, yes. you know, developing a sensitivity and the ability to articulate it, to be erudite, to be well-spoken, to be, you know, concise and thorough in the way we think about things. Having those two things together, then we have what you could call a, an alchemical wedding or divine marriage or, you know, uh, becoming more whole, basically, because we have two hemispheres of our brain which operate in very different ways. 
So it's, it's really about finding the true expression of those things because the masculine showing up in our world today is not very mature. It's not very good. Let's just, I think everyone knows that. People talk about, oh, well, yeah, I'm intellectual. Oh, I'm scientific. I'm logical. And usually that is not the case. They're very rigid, very not intellectual, and very just kind of asleep and afraid and just at the other end of the spectrum. Right. So that's a really, really important part of the journey in that also leads us to the whole thing about boundaries mm-hmm. in developing boundaries. And you know what? If you need to if you need to beat some ass, then you gotta beat some ass. If someone steps their ground, then you need to basically exercise your existential right to use defensive force. Now I don't ne- I don't necessarily mean physically, that's not what I'm saying at all, right. but psychically, energetically, emotionally, whatever. And be prepared that if you're if you usually don't behave that way and you've been behaving your whole life as kind of a slave, people aren't going to like it. They're going to go, wait, 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 no, 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 no. I thought you were this person. I thought you were that person. Well, you're supposed to be this. You're supposed to be loving. You're supposed to take care of me. You're supposed to be blah, blah, blah. And you're going to say, you know what? i got to take care of myself. How am I going to love you? How am I going to do anything if I don't even return and give that same thing to myself? Exactly. I have nothing. And we have to also understand along with that, that like attracts like. And if we have all these holes in our psyche, that's, you know, all the things that we look at in the world and in our life that we don't like, we can't blame them. That's just mold. You know, that's just mold growing on rotten fruit. We have to look at ourselves and be like, why am I leaving this rotten fruit in my being that's just naturally attracting this mold and this fungus and these parasites? Because that's, that's what parasites do. I mean, that's their nature. You can't get mad at them for being parasites because we need them. You know, if they didn't exist, nothing would decay and recycle. We need them. So we have to look at ourselves and say, whoa, why am I leaving this door open? Why am I not? Why am I allowing this? Right. And again, it's a process. It takes time. You know, muscles take time to uh, heal. The deeper tissues in the body, ligaments and tendons take even longer to heal. Our connective tissue takes a long time to reset and readjust. So imagine, you know, <laughs> deep-seated patterns and programming it takes time as well so we have to also just have a, a, a large degree of humor about things you know learning to laugh at ourselves a little bit and learning to laugh at life and not take it all so seriously because to reference the chinese medicine sort of context there you know there's five emotions there's five elements five major organs right and really the <laughs> They're all fairly negative except the emotion of the heart, which is joy. And that doesn't mean like blissed out at a rave on ecstasy. That just kind of means like enjoying your life, having some satisfaction. It's fair, not necessarily that revolutionary, but we have to understand that all the emotions coming from all the other organs, whether it be anger or sadness or fear or anxiety or worry, those all have an effect on the heart and can dampen and suppress that joy or that enjoyment or that, uh, that quality of our, of our light or of, of who we are. So having this, some degree of a sense of humor or just learning to laugh or whatever, that can really make a huge deal. And one huge tip that I'll share with people is if you're doing like meditation or you're doing Qigong or energy, any, any energy practice, You should smile while you're doing it. Hmm. And I don't mean you have to have like a huge like grin on your face, but just lifting the sides of your mouth ever so slightly will completely change the way the energy flows in your body. Mm -hmm. That also has a physiological connection to the the connective tissue around your heart and your diaphragm. It will help relax and release those things. Because when you're doing whatever energy practice, you're basically imprinting a vibration in a way. So... You know, if you're doing your qigong or yoga or meditation, you're pissed off and you're just going about your normal daily anxiety routine, probably not going to be that effective, you know? It's not, you know, I mean, I can tell you, I did that shit for a few years and it, it's not that effective. Wow. <laughs> it's it's not that, that good. But. Say that because I just, a, probably about six months ago, I started doing a routine where every morning when I wake up, I smile first thing because I noticed that when I wake up, my mouth, I'm in, is in sort of a frown. 
And I was, I was waking up really depressed. I'd wake up in the morning and I just didn't want to get out of bed. And I, re- I happened to come across this article about smiling and, and kind of ex- all the things that you said that it actually energetically affects the body when you smile. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to start trying to smile when I wake up. Sorry for the background noise. There's cars driving by. Um, That's all right. <laughs> but yeah, it actually has made a huge difference. And now it's just a, kind of a, a habit that I've gotten to. I smile first thing and it, it was just such a small thing, but I, I was really surprised at how much it has helped my mornings start out on a whole different note. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. It's really, really important. Yeah. So in addition with that, I wanted to, there's so many questions I have for you, but one of the things that you've mentioned before and I wanted to ask you, because there's a few terms that I thought were really interesting, is one you um, talked about being used as a karmic sponge and also being used as a psychic dildo by others. And I really wanted to hear you elaborate on both those things because I thought both of them were really interesting and vivid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the psychic dildo term, I think it'll, it'll be funny to some people and it will really make a ton of sense to a lot of people. Uh, and I'm actually working on some illustrations to like really visually diagram a lot of the stuff, how that uh, phenomena works in relationships, but also in group dynamics or cults or cultures or whatever. Hmm. Uh, but in a, a term in, in uh, relationships, I think a lot of people have felt that where they don't necessarily really feel seen as a person. They feel seen as an image in someone's head. So basically how it plays out is the person isn't necessarily present with you you know, free of an image in their head, free of chatter in their head, and they're in not having their energy coming out through their eyes, looking at you, being with you. Right. Instead, there's an image in their head of you, and they're basically just, that's the dildo, right? They're just getting off on that image <laughs> and and basically, like, just getting off on <laughs> stimulating themselves with it and getting off on it, and it's pretty disgusting, uh, I can tell you, it's it's really dumb, and a lot of people do it, and then they realize they're doing it, and it's gross. Uh, so if you're doing it, stop. It's not good. <laughs> uh, but we all we all kind of do it to a degree, you know. It's part of the, you know, you start to fall in love with someone or get attracted to someone, and then click something in your brain. All these images start coming forward, and oh, well, what will it be like this? What will it be like that? And oh, they're so good and they're so perfect and all, you know, the whole thing just gets, the flip gets switched or the, the switch gets flipped. You know, you just, there's not there's not much you can necessarily do. You can just kind of sit back and watch and laugh. And then eventually over time, things can change. You can't necessarily be like, oh, stop, uh, suppress. That just kind of pushes it down. But just starting to develop an, uh, an awareness about it and be like, oh, yeah, I'm doing that. But again, 99% of people aren't even going to notice that you're doing it. They're not going to be sensitive to it. They're not even going to know that they're doing it because that's just how we're all living all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this new suit or this new purse. My life's going to change. Everything's going to be so much better. People are going to like me. I'm going to feel so good. Uh, And it's just how we're taught to, to live. And if that wasn't a real phenomenon, then I guess all of the billions and trillions of dollars that are spent on marketing and advertising wouldn't be spent because it wouldn't work. But yeah. it is being spent, so it does work. So there is a real phenomenon where people operate like that. And they they live in, we can call it the hollow deck. <laughs> you know, there's like the little hollow deck in their brain. And that's where they're living. It's not out here in the real world. It's in the little hollow deck. Uh, so that's the psychic dildo term. And again, some people are really going to relate to that. Other people are going to think I sound like I'm insane. Whatever. You just kind of have to feel it. Uh, I thought it was perfect. Like, I, I love that term. I think it'd be a great article title. Like, don't be a psychic dildo. <laughs> <laughs> you got to yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. That's, I'll, I'll put, that's on my list. <laughs> So, and then the karmic sponge, like, I think I know what you mean by that, but I'm a little curious when you say, car- like, the word karmic, so you're talking about just in this life, or are you referring to, you know, projecting energy of past lives, or, like, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, we could, 
I'll explain it first, and if you want, I can talk a little bit about what karma actually means versus uh, how, or maybe I'll, I'll just talk about that first real quick, is that how people understand karma and how it's taught to us in the Western world is actually not real. It's actually not, it's not how it is. It's not what it means. Uh, and the reason why people like the idea of karma so much, and even people who aren't, aren't, you know, people who are in, or Christians or who all walks of life kind of will throw around the term. And if it's so easily and widely adopted, we should probably be a little bit alarmed because the idea that God is sitting up there watching you and judging you. And if you do good, he'll reward you. If you do bad, he'll punish you. Sounds a lot pretty darn similar to the idea of karma, that there's this like built in moral judgment in the universe Mm -hmm. where, Oh, we're doing good. So we're going to do good. Or, Oh, someone, I just found the best parking spot ever. I must have good karma or, Oh, someone just gave me 20 bucks. I must have, Oh, I was nice to that person the other day. This must be why that happened. Right. Or that person got raped. They must have bad karma. (laughs) Jeez. Oh my God. I want to like punch people in the face when they say that kind of bullshit. Like, Oh, you were just thinking negative thoughts. That's why. That's why you, whatever. It's like, oh, my God. The most human-centric, immature, adolescent stuff in the world. It's like, oh. But that's a different conversation. I don't don't want to go on that. Uh, But that's that's what people believe. And if everyone believes it and it's so easy, that's probably not, probably something off about it. Really, what it comes down to is kind of, the word really just means doing or action. So in one way we can understand that as just sort of psychological programs or thought viruses or spells or hypnotic trances that we get put in, uh, which can really explain what I mean by karmic sponge. But also we can introduce an interesting uh, duality, which is there's dharma and then there's karma. So the, the, we could replace those words with the authentic and the inauthentic. So if you're living an inauthentic life, you're living in the world of karma, you're, meaning you're living in the world of all these conditions and programs, and you're just acting it out because so-and-so pass it on to you, and so-and-so pass it on to them, pass it on to them, da 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 because that's just how it is. That's what people believe. That's how the world is, or whatever. That's the world, the inauthentic world of karma, and that's where a lot of us live sometimes. Right. But on the flip side, there's the authentic life, which is, it is what it is. It's spontaneous. It's kind of chaotic. It's kind of who knows what. We can't really explain it. We can't really put it into words because if we could, then it wouldn't be what it was. You know, a lot of every tradition and mystical tradition and religion has tried to describe it, but all the words aren't actually the thing. But in our conversation, we've kind of hinted at it a lot as far as tuning into these different things and starting to get a bit more authentic. And that's a bit more of what we call the dharmic life where you're living, you're living, I guess what we could consider moral superiority Mm -hmm. because you understand that to harm another person is to harm yourself, to harm yourself, to harm another person. And you start to really understand what yourself is and what it isn't. And you start to actually become a bit more whole then things really start to shift. So that's a little bit, and we could go on a lot longer about that, but just simply put, that's kind of how people completely misunderstand karma. And not to say there isn't value in in doing good, but the thing is, is that if you're really doing good, why do you need a reward for it? there's There's a quote that said something like, you know, if a man is truly virtuous, why does he need an award or a medal? You know, if you're doing, and this is also, that's kind of in uh, a lot of stuff too. You're talking about attachment versus non-attachment, which we could debunk that a little bit too, because that's really misunderstood. But it's really that whole point. If you're sitting there thinking, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get this, nah, you, you just ruined it because you're in karma, you're attached and whatever. But then if you go to the other side and say, okay, I'm doing this to not get this, to not get that, da, 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 you're still stuck. So really the whole point is to just kind of not care or give up or whatever or just start to respond to more of what you feel inside of you rather than necessarily other things. We could put it that way. So karmic sponge would be basically 
all of us are that, you know, we grow up in a world and we're given a whole boatload of uh, formatting, you know, our computers come formatted with windows or Mac OS X, whatever we're born. We come formatted with, you know, female born in whatever state in whatever year at whatever time into a Christian white Irish family, whatever we, the list goes on and on and on. We get that programming. Mm -hmm. And then if we're kids and if we're of a sensitive type, whatever, which most of us are, we're empathic. We're just sucking all of that up. And but then we're also sucking up a lot of other stuff. You know, well, why has that pattern existed in our family for so long? I don't know. There's probably an emotional component. There's a spiritual component. There's a lot of other information that can be contained in there, like a zip file. So that's kind of what we mean by karmic sponge. And it's really, again, just like in some ways unwinding some of that stuff, but in some ways also not unwinding it, just sort of getting over it. Right. Because sometimes it's also like, it's kind of like a spider web. You know, oftentimes things get stuck in a spider web and the spider really doesn't do anything for a while. It just kind of sits there and waits for it to exhaust itself because a, a fly or whatever insect gets stuck in the spider web. And then the more it struggles to get out, the more it dies, the more it exhausts itself and also the more it ties itself up in the web. So the more it's just killing itself, basically, the spider's just sitting there waiting, being like, I know you're going to get tired, and then I know you're going to not be able to fight me or resist or whatever when I come over there and eat you. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> Sometimes the more we try, the more we do all these things, the more we kind of obviously exhaust ourselves and kind of get more caught up in the web. Right. And I think as that applies to empaths, there's, there seems to be um, a lot of people who believe well, it, because they're sensitive, so either they, they, this is a really interesting one, but it just reminded me what you were talking about being born in with the program, that um, they're more special than other people, so they came in to sort of heal the planet, and that's why they're sensitive, and, yeah. um, and everything's just happening to them, and they're sort of the saviors of the world, so there's that sort of view on it. And then I think a lot of... Um, a lot of just not taking responsibility for for um, just passive energy, like, you know, the passive energy that we're soaking up. And like you you brought up earlier, just being a you're still a match. You're, we're still a match. Like energy matches matches like energy. So if we're picking up a lot of stuff, we're somehow a match to it. So it's still about self responsibility. And I know it's kind of a looped way of of connecting to what you're talking about, but it just reminded me of a lot of what I hear when I first started reading about empaths and. And uh, I think like a lot of people who are really emotionally unhealthy and out of balance, specifically with the masculine energy, it seems like, and, yeah. um, and sort of projecting a lot and then being passive, like, well, it's just, you know, I'm somehow more special than everyone else or more vulnerable or something. I don't know. And um, it just sort of it reminds me of that getting stuck in the, the web and exhausting yourself from, from those sort of ideals and not, a, not really having a, a balanced understanding of that. I mean, it's, it's kind of a natural progression sometimes because when you come out of a really suppressed or disempowered state, the first place you're going to go is the other extreme most of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we had, there's, and you look at it socially, culturally, whatever, whenever there's huge repression, whatever, boom, we get the other side. And, you know, the New Age movement and a lot of these things is not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily all good. It's just the it's a natural reaction, and it's an evolution. And the thing is, is to not get stuck and to realize, oh, all right, yeah, you know, I felt like shit, and then now I'm trying to feel better. Okay, next step. So we're not better or worse than anyone because there's something called cosmic equality. You know, and then also we're all dirt. You know, our bodies are all going to be dirt at some point. And that's where we all came from. That's all we all are. <laughs> Along with everything else, it's really not that big of a deal. But it's just what I notice is that the more a person needs to put themselves up, that automatically signals to me how insecure they are. Right. It's like most of the time whenever someone is really telling you, and really having to hard sell you about what they are. If you just assume the opposite, that's the truth most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Like, 
like the most, some of the most religious people I've ever met have been some of the most amoral and immoral people I've ever known. Mm-hmm. And we don't, have, we don't have to talk about the Catholic Church or any other examples, but history typically reveals that that is pretty true. Yeah. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's a really interesting, um, it's just, I think it's important to just look at as, as anyone who's sensitive, by anyone, not just whether you're sensitive or not, but it's just, I think, looking at these deeper sort of what's behind, what's the energy behind why we do what we do and, and how we're projecting or suppressing our energy. All these things you're talking about, I just think are so crucial to really, ultimately, you're talking about really looking, really looking at yourself and just um, allowing the full picture to come into view and, and letting there be balance. And like you said, I think it's important to remember, too, for anyone listening, is that there are pendulum swings. And for someone who's felt disempowered and weak and vulnerable their whole life, it feels it's a natural progression to go to the other extreme. Um, but it also is natural to sort of balance out. So there's there's one thing I uh, want to add on that, and that is there's a lot of different ways that people try to deal with what we might call negativity, mm-hmm. whether that's in the world or inside of us or whatever. But I, th- I think the most observable, effective way at dealing with it is uh, not ignoring it or, you know, people try to demonize it or run away from it or put it down or suppress it or whatever. People try to do all these things and never works, never has worked ever in human history. Because yeah. <laughs> that's it's not, it's, it's not real. That's not how... You know, it's not how the world works. You know, mono, monoculturing and monocropping is not real, but we keep try, we keep trying to do it. You know, we just oh, just throw more money at it. Oh, we'll just try to do it. But we could all we could sit here and be like, you know what, Monsanto sucks, GMO is terrible, blah 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 blah, factory farming, and everyone would probably be like, that's pretty true, man. You're right. But if I say, you know what, you're doing the same thing to yourself, mm-hmm. everyone's probably gonna be like, oh, what? No, he's crazy. That's not. That's not true. No, we want to blame Monsanto. Mm-hmm. They're the evil ones. Like, no, what about us? Right. So what I'm getting at here is I think what the most effective thing to do, maybe, it's, this, is, this is my hypothesis, let's put it that way, is first you have to understand what you're dealing with. You have to study it. You got to know what it is. Right. You got to understand its nature. And then look at what your options are. Minimize it, yeah. Eliminate it, maybe, or more importantly, fortify yourself against it, build immunity to it, become stronger than it so that when you really understand it and when you really become strong, it doesn't have an effect on you. And a good example of that is people say, oh, the media sucks. I hate TV. I hate movies. And it's all garbage. And there's all this propaganda and mind control and marketing and advertising. Maybe. But if you really understand it and you understand how it works, then it's not going to have an effect on you, really. Right. Because you, you, you see, oh, yeah, look at that symbolism. Oh, they're using this technique. Oh, now they're using that technique. Oh, a guilt play. Good job. Mm-hmm. Oh, phallic imagery. Mm, well played. <laughs> you know, like you can really understand it and have something like, oh, this is funny now. And then you develop that what we might call some symbolic literacy, energetic literacy. You know, we're all literate. We can read. But are we literate on these other levels? It's not necessarily. You know, we, it's like if we're going to grow a garden, we just, we're going to go out and just throw the seeds down and then come back and yell at it every day because it's not growing. That doesn't work, actually. Right. <laughs> you have to understand, oh, this is where I live. Let me, let me check the soil out. Hmm. Soil is imbalanced or balanced in this way. Okay, well, this will grow here really well. Oh, what about this climate? Oh, it's this time of year. Oh, you have to really understand all these things and really put in the work and the time and the energy. And then when you understand it, it gets a lot easier. Then the next year you go back, way easier. The next year you go back, way easier. Right. And then eventually it doesn't take that much work, but it's just understanding what you're dealing with and building that strength and immunity. And that's, I think that's where people need to direct a lot of their energy. Or I shouldn't say that's what I think people should do. I'm just saying that's what I'm doing because right. that's what's working for me. And it seems like the most constructive thing to do right. within the nexus of our control. Because, you know, I, I, had, I had the whole phase where, oh, my God, I'm so, I'm so different than everyone. I'm so 
oh, I'm so much more spiritual. I'm so much more blah, 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 blah. Maybe that's true. Maybe it isn't. It doesn't really matter. Who cares? It's kind of irrelevant. There's no, there's no award committee handing out trophies. You know, this is not a competition. <laughs> so it's, it doesn't matter <laughs> actually at all. Yeah, and I think just back to what you said earlier about just not taking yourself too seriously. I think that's one, for me anyway, especially as someone who's very sensitive, that always helps me when I remember just it, just don't take yourself that seriously. It somehow, yeah. like, it kind of takes a whole weight off my shoulder when I remember that. And I always say, when you get the joke, like, sometimes in the most tragic or seemingly worst catastrophes that happen there'll be moments where you get the joke in it or you get that it's actually <laughs> funny and then you're you're magically sort of free from it when you can laugh at it and that's not to say laugh at someone's you know plight or pain or anything like that but when you can actually see and remember that it's not real but when you authentically get it like when it becomes yeah. authentically funny to you i think it's really freeing like the cosmic joke as they say <laughs> Yeah, I mean, jokes really aren't funny if someone has to explain it to you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's <laughs> kind of your own thing. Um, I would like to add, and we can do this in, I know it's running kind of long, but there's a few more questions I want to cover, so we could do this sure. in, in two parts, just so people yeah. can break it up. But if it's cool with you, um, I would love to hear more. You you talk about you know the acquired self and and how it plays into the way we function in the world, and then you you brought up Western magic before true will and, you know, holy, holy guardian angel. I know these concepts are ones that you, you sent to me. So I would love to hear more elaboration on that. Yeah. There's, this is also where alchemical Taoism and the real roots of Chinese medicine and all this stuff comes from gets really pretty badass because they mapped all this stuff out a long time ago. And it's like, Oh yeah, that's what that is. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. You know, yeah. they, so they they have a, a, a concept for, you know, our acquired self and our original self. They have this concept called da, which is a lot of people translate as virtue. And because we're white moralist people, we think virtue as in like, oh, you're you're a good person. That's what that means. No, it's it's kind of like magic. So like the healing virtue of a plant, this like weird spiritual effect that it has. They have an actual word for a magical spiritual effect that a person can have unconsciously that they just have in the world. There's a word for that. There's an understanding. There's a whole systematic formula around that. Just for one example. I mean, there's, there's another example called uh, Ming and Qing. So there's, they're talking about our sort of heavenly cosmic purpose for being here. That's inside of us. And they have, they have a, a whole concept for that, a whole understanding, a whole huge philosophical system built around that. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, wow, Western culture is really primitive. We have no understanding of that. If you go up to a lot of people and you start talking about that, it's like, well, uh, what do you, what? No, what? just like they check out. <laughs> and, but also all of this stuff is connected to health. It's connected to everything else. It's, if it's within everything else. It's not, You know, oh, over here is your spiritual nature. Oh, wait, then over there is your physical health. No, it's all in the same system. It's all in the same understanding because they understood it's unified. It's all, it's the same thing. You know, water can show up in a lot of different ways, but it's still water. Water is all around us all the time in the air and where I'm exhaling, talking, water's coming out of my mouth, you know, through steam and whatever. If it was cold, I would see it, but I don't see it, but it's there. It's there all the time. And I can go drink some, and that's water. And I can, you know, I don't ever use ice cubes, but if I did, that would be another form of water. Lots of forms of water, but it's still all water. So they understood all these things. And to me, that was originally what was so attractive. It was like, oh, okay, someone gets this and understands it in a way it's very clear and concise and uh very articulated which again goes back to the whole thing I was saying earlier about having both they're not just saying like tune on or what is it tune in turn on drop out they weren't saying that you know they weren't just saying like you know come over here to this party take LSD and everything will be fine we'll change the world no it's it's going to take a lot more than that actually most of the time there are some lucky people who are able to get off on that trip but most of the time 
it's going to take a bit more. So they have this thing about our acquired self and our original self, and this really ties in hugely with what we've been talking about the whole time. So basically the idea of our acquired self is where they believe much of our disease comes from. So dis-ease meaning a, a lack or an absence of ease. So in our original self, we're healthy. We're connected to the cosmos. The chi between ourselves and the universe is flowing really well to our you know, original self as we're in that as we're fulfilling our cosmic contract, even though it's a really shitty translation, but our cosmic reason for being here, our purpose, our mission, our dharma, or all these different words are kind of hinting at this huge, unknowable, but felt kind of thing. And people hear that and think sometimes, oh, well, my purpose is to be a lawyer, or to be a fifth grade school teacher, or to be a billionaire. It's not necessarily what it means. It's not so specific because you have to really consider, does the cosmos really give a shit if you're a lawyer or a teacher? Right. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. There's, you know, it's like, what is behind that? What is the being? What is the quality of being? And this is a huge point that I would like to make is that we have a very quantitative awareness most of the time. You know, we're like, what, we're like, what is the weight in that? You know, does that, does this really matter or we're always measuring and comparing we're very quantitative meaning a quantity of something something you can hold something you can touch and very fixed finite defined rigid kind of thing which is incredibly important for sure but we lose our qualitative awareness which we're talking if we talk about energy or spirit these things it's going to require a real qualitative awareness because when you start talking about symbolism, start talking about divination, you start talking about art and creativity, those are all very qualitative. Right. You know, like, for example, people talk about, you know, five element theory, which, again, the word element is a terrible translation as an aside. The character in Chinese has nothing to do with the word element. It actually just inf- it applies to more of a movement, but someone translated it really poorly. So that's what I was saying earlier about not idealizing or putting Eastern stuff on a pedestal. That's part of the reason is because many of these things are translated so terribly that they actually don't really mean much of what they actually mean in the real, in the real, in the real tradition. Uh, So anyway, but anyways, back to the point, which was, what was that? What was I saying before the element thing? Um, You were talking about the, the acquired self and the the sense of, um, Oh yeah. Qualitative awareness. Uh, Yeah. yeah, because when we start talking about, oh, this is um, this is a very wood element thing. You know, wood element is about like growth and expansion and moving forward and planning and making decisions, these kinds of things. Eventually, you study that element enough and you understand this is a quality. This is a, sure, I'm using these words, but there's a feeling or something behind there that I can, I can see around in the world. You know, I can go out in the woods. I can see it. I can see it in people. I can see it in situations. I can see it all around, but it's an underlying quality of something. And it's the same kind of aesthetic sense that many artists have, you know, because most of us don't really have a relationship to light or color contrast or depth or, you know, angles or frames or, you know, all kinds of music terminology. Most of us don't have a really intimate relationship with those things, but people that are very artistic have a very deep relationship with those things. And, you know, my hypothesis is that old humans had a much more qualitative understanding, which allowed them to be much more in tune with the natural world. They had an actual relationship with the natural world. They could talk to it. They could communicate to it. They could talk to plants. And there's stories, even now in modern times, of, you know, shamans and medicine doctors in uh, the Amazon who know thousands and thousands and thousands of plants and every, all these intimate details about it. And people ask them like, how did you possibly learn all this stuff? And they'll say, Oh, the forest told me, mm-hmm. or, Oh, this plant told me about it. Yeah. And they weren't like, well, I went to university and I got my PhD and then I did my internship and uh, eventually, you know, dialed it all in and now here I am. <laughs> they didn't say that because you know, there's value in that, but there's also a huge limitation in that. Mm-hmm. And we're at this point where people are so smart that they're actually stupid. Yeah. 
like to think that your intellectual, logical, rational brain is the king of the crop is you're losing out on so much of life. And I think a lot of the times people get depressed and especially empathic or sensitive people, they get depressed or they get anxiety, they get addictions because they lost their relationship with what we might call the inanimate world, which is it's not really inanimate. That's actually a put down, but that's what people call it the inanimate world, you know, and as kids, we probably had those things. We would go out and say, wow, look at the trees, look at the leaves, look at the grass, look at the crickets or look at the sun or the clouds and look at all these things that are around me and are so exciting and alive and vibrating and breathing. Oh my God, this is really awesome. We had a relationship with all these things which are inanimate, you know, and in some ways we would just play with toys all the time and that was sort of the surrogate for it, but we all still have that capacity. And I think that's a lot of times why people feel so isolated and alone. And this is a, something I've really started to come to a lot is that we're conditioned to try to get so much from other people that it's not really real or realistic or necessarily even possible. Yeah. You know, we're taught, you know, people are all you can relate to. People are all you can get whatever from approval or love or attention or whatever the stuff we think we need when we just say you know what fuck you rest of the world i got this yeah. <laughs> me and my me and my human friends over here this is all this is we got this <laughs> what do you know we don't feel very good right so that's a huge piece but getting back to the <laughs> the point that's kind of a huge tangent <laughs> is that it, it's really a lot pretty much everything i've been saying so far is just dancing around and pointing at getting people back to the original self which if we simply sum up Chinese medicine, it basically says that when you're living in harmony with yourself and thus the universe, because if you're in, in harmony internally, you're going to be in harmony externally because it's the same. So if you're in harmony with yourself, health will result. If you're not, disease or blockage will result. Mm-hmm. Where, it, where energy moves and flows, there's health. Where it blocks, there's disease. Simply put, to sum up the whole system. But the reason why I'm doing that is to flip to the other side and look at a lot of Western magic understanding, which some people may be familiar with, maybe they're not, but I just want to demonstrate that it's kind of a universal human thing that a lot of people have hinted at in different ways. So people have maybe heard of Aleister Crowley or different other magicians and, you know, moral character aside and people's lives aside, there's... There's ideas and philosophies in there which are very useful and applicable. And people think magic is, well, first we should just define what we mean by magic. People think magic is like, are you going to light some candles and draw a circle and get some pentagrams and dance naked in the woods or draw blood or, you know, drink urine or whatever the hell weird stuff people think (laughs) that really comes down to. But really we can define magic as basically anything that creates a transformation across your whole being. Hmm. So notice I didn't say change. I said transformation and I said your whole being. So meaning mentally, emotionally, spiritually, psychically, blah, 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 everything. So, you know, that sounds weird, but, you know, people, you get moved by a song or you get moved by, you know, a film or you get, you just look up and you're like, whoa, look at the, just the angle right now on the clouds and the sun and the tree for some reason is just perfect and it moves you. That's, that's magical. That creates, you just, afterwards you're just like, I'm a different person. I don't know why you just feel different. And a lot of times we have these experiences. We don't savor them. We don't pay attention to them. We don't say, Oh wow, that's amazing. Let, let me have some more of that. So that's kind of what we mean by magic and why I said transformation versus change is change is kind of like, you know, you're using your willpower. Like, all right, well, now I'm this, ah, but I'm going to try my best to do that. Or, you know, I want to lose weight, but I got to make myself go to the gym, but I hate going to the gym, but I have to go to the gym. So that's how I have to lose weight. That's 99% of the time, just what we could call the boomerang effect. Never going to work. Yeah. But transformation due to a magical act, that transformation means literally going above form to transform is basically go above form. So Current form, boom, transform into something else above it, which what I was saying earlier about basically working on yourself or making yourself strong, it's kind of what, it's what I'm hinting at is basically this transformation to where the other thing, to a large degree, becomes irrelevant. Right. 
you don't say like, oh, I can't do that or I shouldn't do that. You just say nothing. You're like, eh, whatever. You know, it's kind of like I used to be a huge sugar junkie. You know, like pretty much my whole life is just what I was raised to to drink and eat. I mean, I, for for years, all my breakfast was was Pop Tarts and Gatorade. <laughs> you know, uh, to me, I was like a healthy breakfast. And oh, for lunch, I'm gonna have pizza and a soda. And then for dinner, God knows what. Then after dinner, I have some cookies. And then I, you know what? Before I go to bed, I have a huge bowl of ice cream. That was literally every day for most of my life. But then once I started, you know, eating differently and trying to take care of my body a little bit, it's like, whoa, I'm really addicted to sugar. Like, I really need this sugar. I really, I'm, I'm flipping the fuck out right now because I can't have sugar. I gotta have it. You know, I feel like a drug addict. So I'm like, I want it. I need it. I can't have it. Okay. I want it. I need it. Okay. I can't have it. And just like back and forth. And I'm sure you've been there. Everyone's been there. Everyone has had that experience. But, Eventually, I just got on to the whole probiotics thing and green juice and doing other things. Then eventually, I'm just like, eh, I don't really want that at all. It's disgusting. Yeah. Actually, it turns me off. And then now, occasionally, if I want dessert or something, maybe I'll have it if I want it. But it's there's no emotional tie. And I have found, you know, another place of just like balance, you know, where, yeah, I'll eat uh, perfect food bars. I've never heard of those. Okay. Well, they have honey in them. Okay, cool. You know, so I can eat things which are sweet, but not be a drug addict about it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And not, not be controlled or driven by it because I put other strategies in place that created homeostasis and balance and sort of strengthened me against it in a way. So that's what I mean by transformation. And that can take time or it can happen instantaneously. Like it just depends, you know, it's a very unique situation, but I wanted to really uh, define those terms. And then this may or may not be contextually relevant, but if we're talking about the true will, uh, this is, you know, people heard like the magical quote, like uh, magic is uh, like basically making change happen under your will. And, you know, the famous magical quote, you know, do what thou wilt shall be the law, and that whole thing. And a lot of idiots and really maybe well-intended and not necessarily very intelligent people took that stuff very literally and didn't really do the homework to understand what that actually meant because the term true will is not talking about your ego. It's not talking about, well, I want a million dollars and I want a mansion. And I want this kind of partner and I want this many kids and I want this kind of fence and I want this and that. I want to create my reality. It's not what it's talking about at all. It's talking about more of this original self. It's talking about more of going through this process of, trial and tribulation and dark night of the soul what you were saying earlier that's and through that you start to discover what the true will is your, your dharma or why you're here or what your purpose is or who you are or your sense of i-ness you start to discover all those things and that becomes you know the magical act that becomes the holy act that becomes uh you know endows and then you have duh you have virtue you have this this uh magic virtue impact thing about you which is this is what the law of attraction and all these new agey stuff are trying to, to tell you you can just have as a skill you know you can just learn this little piece and then you'll have the power mm -hmm. but it, what people don't realize is that sh that shit is just all based on really old esoteric western magic right. like, like uh the kybalion is one example of that or people take one little piece and take it out, but they again they're well intending maybe, but they don't they don't understand that it's actually about way more than that. Right. And if you're if you're having to use your will, that's not very sustainable. You're going to get bored. You're going to get distracted. You're going to get tired. So that's not really the the greatest way to to do it. And you know, let nature do it. That makes way more sense. Let the cosmos do the work because that makes way more sense. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. But yeah, but that comes at the cost or the sublimation of all the conditioning or the acquired self, you know, all the stuff you've been taught and conditioned to believe and think you need and all this. And so in some ways, that's how all of these things uh, really tie together and uh, make a lot of sense, which from that foundation, you know, it's allowed me to really understand health in a pretty large way and understand the physical uh, manifestations of a lot of these things where like and honestly it kind of sucks <laughs> it's 
So to be quite honest with you, because, you know, I have an herb company, I have a business and it's selling herbs, you know, that's how I make a living. That's what my whole business is. But I just have this whole other understanding and way of seeing things. And to be quite honest, I'm not exactly sure how people are responding to it because I put out content, put out videos, do podcasts, teach classes. And I'm, I'm, I don't know about the feedback I get from people. I don't get that much. And I'm like, I don't know what, you know, what's really going on here. You know, I feel like in some ways people just, just want just to take a pill and forget about it, which I get, you know, I take plenty of pills. I take plenty of herbs. I get that. But we have to understand if we're talking about Chinese medicine, we're talking about alchemy, we're talking about three treasures or whatever concept, it all came out of the quest for the original self or the true will or, um, basically spiritual mortality or whatever these different words are all trying to describe um, the same thing. Right. And the, the last term that you mentioned, which I'll define really quickly is uh, holy guardian angel. And that sounds, that's like kind of a loaded word for those of us raised in this monotheistic world, but it's kind of just referring to our inner self, our inner spirit, our inner guide, um, our inner light, our inspiration in spirit. Um, all these things are kind of hinting and pointing at that thing, which is really kind of hard to, to uh, define, but it's really been understood as that is the number one most magical thing you can do, the highest priority magical act and ritual and task is to get in touch with that. Mm-hmm. And once you're in touch with that, that's, that's it. That's what you need. So a lot of, you know, Chinese medicine says the same thing and Taoism says the same thing. And Can you hear that, by yeah, the way? Yeah, what is that? <laughs> People in, my, in the hallway are <laughs> um, happy. They're having a good day or something. They just needed to yell outside my door. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of what that means. And basically, when we talk about health, we talk about the state of the world. How can we really expect to live in peace and harmony and utopia and whatever, if every day we're basically giving the middle finger to our own inner temple, our own, you know, our own inner temple is in ruins. It's falling apart. It's in pieces. It's got tumbleweeds blowing through it and cockroaches in it. And we're running around in the world expecting people to say, oh, you have to give me love or you have to give me approval or you have to give me this and if you don't I'm going to be upset and sad or you know oh why is the world so messed up and why can't people get along and we say all these things but meanwhile our, our own temple is a pile of shit yeah. and, and we're not we don't want to we don't want to say oh right let me so let me take care of this and that's the thing is if you if we want to have an impact we want to have power we want to have whatever we want to have might need to to identify with you know that process first maybe yeah, yeah. I totally agree with you, and I actually feel when you, you were earlier mentioning just feedback from your work, and it's one of the reasons I was I found you online. I don't know, like three years ago, and um, it was when I was kind of first getting into a lot of this stuff, just trying to. I was just sick of myself, and I didn't understand anything, and I was trying to, you know, nothing had worked before, and um, you know, so I started to get into, I guess, reading a lot of new agey stuff, which some of it resonated, most of it didn't. And um, with, I have always appreciated that you you stay with the foundation of things and don't bloat. Uh, you don't you don't offer people, people pills. And I guess that um, and also I love what you're talking about now is the the magic side of it, which can obviously be defined in many different ways. But I think that getting back to that that self, that inner self. I know for me when I get in touch with that when I when I've I really came to the end of um, trying to use, you know, whatever to, to, to get away from how I felt and also stop trying to, you know, mind masturbate because I used that <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And really just, like, just had to be with myself, just really be. And a lot of it was hard, but at the same time, I, I that that is the place that I think we connect to magic. We connect to the, the subtle energies of, of the way nature speaks to us, of the way cycles work, of the way um, our own being is, is just being. And I, I've always appreciated the way that you, I feel like your stuff always sort of brings people back to that and, and kind of 
knocks down hubris a little bit because it's really, really <laughs> easy to get into, um, you know, building the self up. But I think what does it mean to be, you know, that that is, you know, I guess the existentialist philosophers were the started asking that after we were forever just asking what does it mean to know you know yeah. but what does it mean to be is as i feel like the real question and that's what i feel like you're getting at here and yeah. I, and i do feel like that's so important for anybody especially empaths and i think the advantage someone who's really sensitive has in this whole thing is that when you really do tune in you it there's our, our fine, like subtle ways of, of feeling energy can be so fine tuned that we can actually experience so much more of this experience. Yes, the hard things harder, but also the, the, just the way that nature speaks, for example, or anything, any, any sort of, um, connection to energy around us, it can also be heightened in a really amazing way when we get in touch with that self, that inner self, or what, what you refer to as the holy guardian angel. I think that, um, it's just, regardless of how many, you know, tips and techniques that work for people to cope with being sensitive or to cope with just being alive and being human. Um, it always, ha it always comes back to that is what is, what, what is our being and what does it mean to be? And, and I think going there and starting there is, is the foundation. And I, I appreciate that you do that. I don't think a lot of people, I don't, I don't, I don't hear a ton of people talking about this kind of stuff, which is why I was excited to do this interview with you. <laughs> Yeah, I think one one thing that I got onto, or maybe I don't even get onto it. It's just been, it's just I've really come to just accept and try to understand. That's just how my brain works. Um, but it's also the way people approach things is uh, what we could say is trying to acquire and, con and construct versus uh, get rid of or deconstruct. Yeah. And there's there's a difference between deconstructing and destructing. Mm -hmm. so they're very different uh, processes and words. You know, if you're gonna be if you're gonna be destructive, you're just gonna destroy everything and really just create a mess. But if you're gonna deconstruct it, you can put it back together again. You know, that's a, that's actually how a lot of people have learned skills. You know, people oh. How did you learn to build whatever? Well, I took it apart and I put it back together again. I took it apart and I put it back together again. That's how I learned how it all worked. Right. So people, the, the whole deconstructive thing is not very uh, popular <laughs> in our world uh, right now. People are all about, you know, acquiring, you know, okay, I'm inadequate. I'm feeling whatever. Now I need to go get all of these things. And again, that's a natural process. I've been there. We all got to go through it. Yeah. And it's a natural process that I have to say, you know what, uh, my opinion and lens on the world is, yeah, it's just a lens. It's not the only lens. It's maybe not even the right lens, but it's how my brain naturally works is to be more deconstructive. And the point I'm getting at is when we can acknowledge the false as the false, then it's much easier to see the truth. Yeah. And why I'm saying to be deconstructive is because people think something's wrong with them. They have to go out and get something and be fixed. What I'm saying is you're actually already okay. Yeah. All the stuff inside of you is good. It's fine. You're, you're, you're fine. The problem is there's all this bullshit on top of it that's, you know, messing it up. So how about get rid of that and then, oh, oh things are better now. Yeah. So but that requires a huge degree of trust because, you know, we're taught that if we're not, like, controlling or contriving or holding on to something or trying to force, then we're not doing anything. We're not working or whatever. But it's not really true because – you can at some point just be like, yeah, I don't really need that, you know, forget it. And then boom, something else probably way better will, will take its place. But again, it's just deconstructing. It's, it's not necessarily that spiritual. It's not necessarily that esoteric. It's actually just a matter of paying attention and understanding it, having a map. And, you know, it's like if you're having a garden, the first year, first few years, it takes a lot of work. And then once things take root, then it's way easier. Then it's maintenance. You know, then you just, oh, here's some weeds over here. Let me get those out. No, okay, I'll get those out. Because, you know, weeds are natural. Mold is natural. Fungus is natural. Parasites and viruses, they're all things that are natural in the world. And we can't, you know, demonize them like we tried to do in Western culture and pasteurize and homogenize everything and antibacterialize everything and sanitize everything. It doesn't work, actually. It just creates stronger and stronger and stronger 
viruses and whatever, just like prohibition. People thought, oh, we're going to outlaw alcohol. And that just actually made it stronger and more powerful. Right. So that, that doesn't work. We're going to outlaw drugs. No, we're just going to create a bunch of cartels all over the world. Okay, that doesn't work. So we just have to, uh, yeah, understand that these things are natural and they exist and do what we can to fortify ourselves and take care of our own garden. Right. And the whole point, I guess, that I'm making is just, yeah, being uh, deconstructive and having that um, trust and faith. Or not even, not, those words are not even really that uh, applicable. It could just be like, fuck it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it, could, it could be as simple as that. I mean, right. it could just be, in, because people try to make, like I saw a video recently because I was doing some research on like self-love and, and self-hatred on YouTube, you know, just see like, what are people saying about these concepts? And there is some of the, so much just not very good information on there about that. And this, this chick was talking about, uh, oh, well, you can't do anything until you love yourself this much and you can't, you're not going to be able to do this. And you're not going to be able to do that. You have to be able to love yourself and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I'm like, uh, have you seen much art? I mean, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> most, most of the art on the planet was not created because people were in harmony and loving themselves and blah, 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 blah. It, that's not true. Sometimes it's just as simple as being like, I don't know. This is roll the dice. See what happens. Or, or like, cool, I'm really depressed or I'm really angry and really frustrated. All right, whatever. I'm going to go do this thing and get out of my life. Right. It's not a big, <laughs> but people, especially, you know, you know, like what you were saying earlier, people want to act like they're more special or than other people. It's like, not really like just because this is something that I've understood a lot in relationships is, uh, you know, people that are more emotionally, whatever, really want to indulge and blow their stuff up and act like they're superior and everyone else is broken. When in reality, the non, the less feeling person is not better or worse than the more feeling person and vice versa. Right. It's just different. And it's just their experience. And who's to say what's actually more or less? Because we can't hook each other up to a meter and be like, yep, you're 119 on the emotional scale. And yep, you're only 67. So this person is definitely more sensitive than you. Right. No, it could actually just be how we are handling it. Right. You know, it, it could be a lot of things. So who knows? <laughs> Well, and, and kind of back to what you said earlier, I think when you were talking about deconstructing, I think when we understand how something works, like you said, it's not as effective, it doesn't work on us anymore unless we want it to, you know what I mean? So I think that's just crucial in even understanding ourselves and our own emotions when we understand how we work and why we feel the way we feel or how our emotions function, it's that they're less likely to control us. And you know, everything you're pointing back to is just, you know, I think self-reflection, getting to know yourself, you know, I guess like self-actualization, all these terms that we talk about, but we don't really know what they mean. Sure. Um, but that can mean, like, I, I just love what you're painting here. At least what I'm getting out of it is this idea that there's not one standard and there's not one way. And it's, it's, the, there's not even one objective. Like, Oh, the objective is to be happy. You know what I mean? Nope. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's really about just being and, and learning how to be in harmony with where you are at any given moment. And I think that it's crucial, especially for empaths. I know for me, I just, I, I, I can, I used to feel like, okay, if I'm feeling extreme, you know, in any way I would, I would sort of tackle it and have to understand every little thing about why, you know, like have to yep. deconstruct myself and think of myself as a problem. And I always just sort of approach myself like a problem to be solved, but kind of what you were saying earlier, which is sort of the whole bucket. Like I just am, I just feel what I feel. I'm just where I'm at. Okay. Now let's, you know, like, how can I move from there? How can I harmonize with where I am now? And I also love the point you just brought up about some of the best art has been done when people are in really shitty places. And I can even speak for that myself. Some of the most like traumatic and hard times in my life, I've produced some of the best work. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's why we're here. We wouldn't have chosen to come into a world of intense contrast if we weren't meant to sort of play in it, you know? Yeah, I agree. And it's just like uh, learning to surf or learning to ride the waves, you know? Yeah, exactly. So there's still so much we didn't talk about. I know we didn't really go. Is there anything else you want to cover before we end it? Because I know we didn't really talk about boundaries um, or just sort of solutions for empaths, like in terms of regaining their health. Was there anything you wanted to touch on there? Yeah, I should say a few things about that because it's um, important. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I think the, the biggest point is uh, not necessarily telling, telling people what to think or what to do, but how, mm-hmm. you know, how to think. Because honestly, I mean, like you were saying, there's not one objective. You know, there's lots of different objectives and lots of different realities and lots of different experiences, and that's totally cool. Um, so one thing that I've learned is that really the more you work on yourself, the more you can, uh, I don't know, attract better experiences or more supportive experiences. And kind of what I'm hinting at is that the more you really work on yourself and prepare yourself, uh, the more you can attract people into your life that can help you. So teachers, guides, healers, whatever. For me, I think that's a really, really important thing, having people who can really help and support you in lots of different ways. For me, I've met a number of different uh, practitioners. I wouldn't really call them healers or therapists, but they just practice uh, art, I guess, or practice the Chinese art, let's call it that. But they've been really helpful. And But it's just, I think it has a lot to do with just uh, me investing a lot of time and energy in myself and being humble enough to realize, like, I don't really, I don't really know. So I could definitely benefit from the experience and wisdom and knowledge and information and skills of someone else. Not that they necessarily know or I'm putting them on a pedestal, but they might be able to point out certain things for me or help me look at things in a different way that is supportive. Right. You know, not do the work for me, not tell me what to think, but maybe how to think or how to look at it. That's really helpful. Whether that's a relationship or a friend or a group of friends or a book, it could be a lot of different things, but that's a really important thing. But that, again, is contingent upon working on ourselves because people that are skilled and are busy, they don't necessarily want to have a kid. They don't want to have a child. They don't want more responsibility because they got a lot going on, you know? So work on yourself a lot. So you're not a burden. So you're not a responsibility to them. So you can, you know, be of some uh, value in addition to them rather than being a drain. So that's one, one point that I would want to make. And then that would lead to finding uh, disciplines or hobbies or specific skill sets that are give the person energetic literacy, mm-hmm. meaning learning to uh, basically cl- cleanse or purge their, their energetic system or balance and modulate different parts of their system. Having that literacy is pretty important and having the literacy in their own body to, re- to release tension and release stress and release anxiety and actually start to have a direct um, communion with their body because the body, people, oh, the body's a temple, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's actually kind of an instrument or a barometer because they can tell you about situations and you'll notice, ah, I'm hanging around this person and my solar plexus just is really tight. Oh, okay. Might need to pay attention here. Oh, I'm around this person. I don't know. I just feel really relaxed and grounded. Oh, Okay. And that's, that's a different decision process versus, well, they're really nice. They said all these nice things, and we have all these things in common. And, well, they know these people, and I know that people, and we have all blah, blah, blah. That's a different thing right. all together. That's just your body being like yes or no. Yeah. Much simpler, much easier. Because your body is way smarter than you are. Let's yeah. put it that way. <laughs> and if pe- people want to talk about the higher self, and not that I would say that the higher self is the physical body, but if someone said your higher self was your physical body, they would be closer than people who say it's somewhere else or it's up there and you have to bring it down. That's garbage, right. honestly, because the more actually, the thing is people say they want to be psychic. They want to be more conscious. They want to be more awake and they think they have to go up. But that's actually a misinformation. The more actually in your body you are, the more psychic and in tune and conscious and aware and everything you are because that's actually real. That's actually a uh, reality. Yeah. And I actually so, think that a lot of empaths um, disassociate a lot. A lot of people who feel really um, sensitive to people and groups of people not only become agoraphobic, but also just psychically disassociate and actually get more and more out of touch with these, with their extrasensory abilities and call it being empathic, but it's actually just disassociation and then agoraphobia on that. And I think you're dead on with that. 
at least for me, I have found the more I go in my body and which is hard, especially if you've been through trauma, if you have any physical trauma, like yeah. you know, anything and a lot of, a lot of people have sexual abuse or just any sort of trauma in the body. It's, it's yeah. hard to do that, but it's freeing. And I think you're so right. Like the body is so intelligent and so wise. And I do think it's closer to the higher self. And I have found that to be really true. Like going within is really the most powerful journey you can take. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you have if you have a network or networks of practitioners, whether they do body work modalities or whatever, things that produce real tangible results in your life. And and this is the thing you have to I have to add in this caveat is sometimes people are healers or whatever, but just because someone is in the spiritual world or the energy world doesn't mean they're good doesn't mean they're good at what they do. It doesn't mean they're necessarily morally good. That's what I mean, because I've heard plenty of stories of people who are, oh, they're such a good healer, they're such a good energy worker, but they're actually kind of psychic vampires on people. They actually do a huge disservice. So you have to really, that's what I was saying earlier about having you know, a strong, mature masculine, having healthy boundaries, having your wits about you, having your physical senses about you to be like, ooh, something's really off here or something's really on here. So, you know, if you have teachers that teach you various arts or are further ahead of you, or that's a shitty way to put it, but maybe have more experience or more years or they have some wisdom or skills that they can share with you, but making sure they don't do it in a way where you're basically, uh, you know, that little fish that's like sucking on the side of a whale. You know, you don't, that's not really a very good place to be either. Right. But also... What you're saying is very true, and you know everyone has these things in their tissues and in their structures. So that's why I'm really driving home the point of taking care of yourself, making yourself strong, and then your body will will purge those things. It'll naturally let go of those things when it has, when it feels strong enough to be able to do it. Because disassociating all these things, those are natural protective mechanisms that our body will do. The ego itself is a protective mechanism. You know, our our sense of division is a protective mechanism born in pain because at some point we experienced something that we had to do divide from. So at some point though, when we become strong enough inside or whatever, or the stars align or who knows what the conditions would be. But at some point there happens a thing where that can, we can realize, Oh yeah, don't really need that anymore. You know, just like at some point you're riding your bike and you realize I don't need these training wheels anymore. I'm actually, I got this. I'm good. I can do this. So I just really want to drive on that point of to have a practice, to have a discipline, you know, to have something that you train and work at and develop yourself in, in many ways. It's, it's like the stereotypical, like movie, you know, the hero myth, mm-hmm. the hero's lost, you know, he has these abilities, but he's just this weak individual, this, this regular nobody. But then all of a sudden, this path appears, this opportunity finds him, but he's not, he's unprepared because he's just regular old whatever. But then he has a teacher. Teacher's like, oh, you know, you have these abilities, you have blah, 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 but, you know, you're going to have to work. And then, (laughs) and then every movie, you know, they have the whole like fast forward, like montage of the person training the music. And then three minutes later, they're a master or, you know, whatever. But there's a real mythology that's in there. And there's a reason why, movies like Star Wars and The Matrix and hundreds of other movies that are retelling the same mythology over and over again. There's a reason why they're so successful and why they resonate with our psyche so deeply. So that's a very real thing. There's a, you know, the, the movie didn't exist first. You know, a person didn't just make that up. They saw it in real life. They saw it from the collective unconscious or from who knows what and put that in a movie. So it's, that's real. <laughs> that's our life. That can be our life. We can take that journey. And people like Joseph Campbell tried to tell us that uh, a long time ago, actually. So, but that's only contingent upon us. Again, everything I was saying so far, having that uh, ability. And then um, the last thing that I could share with people, which is kind of something to do, um, something that I did recently and it's cool. It's very simple, very easy, doesn't take a lot of time, but could be powerful for some people if it's the right time. And it's all you, all you really need to do is uh, have some time to yourself and find somewhere empty or as empty as you can get away from people 
away from your phone, away from, you know, all technology, put all that shit away, leave it in your car, leave it wherever, and just go out somewhere in nature, whether, depending on your ecosystem, whether that's a forest or a desert or a canyon or I don't know, whatever it is, wherever you can find that. Or maybe it's just a park that you go to early in the morning or late at night or whatever. Do what you have to do. This is really just about you and your environment. So basically you just go to your forest, which is an example I'll use because that's what's close to me. Just go to the forest and you basically just uh, say to your, you just are with yourself and you just basically say like, hey, you know, I'm sorry. You, you, what you're doing here is you're talking to nature, you know, so you're looking out, you're like, hey, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I know I've been a, know I've been kind of an ass for however many years. I'm sorry for all these idiots <laughs> that are uh, doing all these crazy things. Uh, and you basically say, hey, I'm sorry, you know, but I'm, you know, I'm here. Like, I'm back. I'm listening. You know, what, what can I do? Uh, you know, will you help me? Like, please, I need help. I need whatever. You have this open communication, this dialogue, and your attitude is an attitude of nothing, really. You're not trying to get anything. You're not looking for anything. You have no intention. You're just doing it. You're just open. Nothing nothing might not happen. You might just sit there and talk to yourself, get mad, and walk away. All right, whatever. That's what you had to do. Or, I don't know, something else could happen. I did it, and it was pretty meaningful and impactful for me, and I'll probably do it again next time I get the opportunity. But that's basically all you do. You just walk out and just basically say, hey, I'm here. I'm sorry. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. That's pretty powerful. So it's just, I think that's a, a major thing that people can do. And um, maybe more people could give it a shot. I don't know. Because the thing is, our our original self is uh, what in Buddhism and even Hinduism, because Buddhism is just Hinduism stripped down, uh, there's a term called an Atman, which means basically no self, non-self. So no independent self, no separate self. And there's another term called mutual arising. There's another term uh, which basically just means of itself, so spontaneously. So that's all leading up to understanding that our self is just nature. Right. You know, that's that's our real self, and we don't really know what that is because it's called, quote-unquote, the unconscious. Right. <laughs> so... It's it's really it's not a big deal. It's not really it's not special. That's there's just a phrase in uh, in Zen that I love, and it's nothing special. It's like oh wow, you just uh, transcended reality and went outside of your body and communed with these deities, and you went to the uh, Pleiades galaxy and you flew around, blah blah blah. All right, whatever. Uh, go you know go wash the dishes. Right. Like really really not a big deal at all actually. Like. <laughs> so powerful about when you're in nature or just quiet and at least at least for me I've never done that particular why I've asked like said I'm sorry like I've never done it in that particular exact way yeah I've had experiences where I've just connected and there's something so amazingly non-special like you said but but yet profound about just nature I think for me is it just demonstrates what being is it doesn't try to fix it. Like I mean, I guess it's, it doesn't think. It doesn't. It's, it doesn't. Ha- it doesn't think like a mind. It just is. Yeah. It's just being. Yeah. And and I think what what it feels like to me, like this whole conversation has been leading back to constantly, is that like is being and getting back in connection with what that means. And yeah. I think nature is one of the most powerful ways to do it, especially when you can just allow your again your kind of sort of extrasensory aspects that that energetic imprint to really connect to all that subtle energy and at least for me it, it does I feel like it balances my body in a way that nothing else has ever come close to when sure. I connect yeah. in that way yeah super powerful well let me just say this last quote and I'm, I'm gonna butcher it because I don't remember exactly who said it uh and what it exactly was but it's basically uh nature is spirit manifest spirit is nature unmanifest I like that. 
So, wow, well, yeah, thank you so much. Like, I just feel like this was a lot. I'll, I'm sure I'll do this in, like, two or three parts or something so people can kind of digest it. But I, I, yeah, really, sure. I really like it. Um, I really I really like everything that you're pointing to. And thank you for all the work that you do and um, just for being a different voice out there. I just really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for interviewing me and for having me on and for featuring me on your website. You know, if it weren't for... Uh, platforms and avenues like yours, uh, I wouldn't have a voice. <laughs> you know, I would just be sitting alone uh, talking to myself. So, thank you as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. And any anytime you want to, anytime you want to talk about anything or write an article.